In this opening scene at the south end of the DTNI at Ironton, Ohio, on the Ohio River, we see the yard engine switching a cut of cars on Railroad Street just three blocks from the Ohio River. It is moving south as the southbound passenger train number six returns from Jackson about 45 miles to the north. Note the runabouts, largely of Henry Ford's manufacture, and the horse-drawn wagon as we approach the station. Ironton was founded in 1849 because of the rich iron ore deposits along the north side of the Ohio River, just north of the village. At its peak, the town had nearly 90 iron furnaces producing pig iron for many of the industries in the United States and globally. And it was also a source for much coal and fine foundry sand used throughout the entire country. The passenger train on this end of the railroad typically consisted of a coach, a combination baggage car, RPO, and a baggage car. The DTNI was a mid-street operation right down the heart of Ironton on Railroad Street. From the train we can see the buildings as they approach the station at the end of 2nd and Railroad Street. In this 1921 Ford film, the DTNI station at 2nd Street is visible. In the background is the new Ironton Russell Ohio River Bridge which was opened in 1922. Its length was 2400 feet. The passenger train you see stopping here was on the east leg of the Y, which also held the platform for which passengers could board and leave the train. DTNI passenger trains of this era were neither glamorous nor luxurious. They were utilitarian means of transporting people from one community to another along the line. The passenger station on the left also served as the freight house in Ironton. This station was built in 1909, replacing an older wood frame structure on the same site. It was a rather busy station along the Ohio River, serving both the needs of the community as well as the many foundries and other industries in the region at the time. After unloading the train at the station, it was back north to the north switch for the Y and then it proceeded south along the west leg of the Y to eventually turn and back up to the roundhouse facility, which was east of the depot along the Ohio River. Locomotive number 83, a 460 built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in 1904, featured 63-inch drivers and 175 PSI of steam pressure. It had recently been put through the Ford shops and given the Ford treatment for appearance purposes. This is the equipment that was often reported as being wiped by the engine crew every time the train stopped, and they did. Improvements included chromed raised letters and numbers, the new DTNI logo, the highly polished Russian iron, and the highly noted and touted polished appearance. In this day, all of the passenger equipment were wood-bodied cars. After the passenger train had cleared through the Y, one of the yard engines would bring up the local freight cars to be switched out on the two tracks of the freight house. Vesuvius Station was about four miles north of Ironton and just about four-tenths of a mile south of Royersville Tunnel. Royersville Tunnel was the only such tunnel on the DTNI Railroad. It was originally constructed about 1851 by the Iron Railroad to serve the many iron furnaces in this region. At 956 feet of length, it followed a mined coal seam through the side of the hill. Thus it was not shaped as we would imagine a normal tunnel would be. The floor of the tunnel was deepened in order to accommodate the laying of rails. In the early 1880s, the Toledo, Delphus, and Burlington Railroad, a narrow-gauge railroad of that day, achieved Ironton by laying a third rail through the tunnel for a dual-gauge railroad. It was subject to frequent ceiling collapse, and when Ford purchased the railroad, tunnel speeds were limited to 6 miles per hour, a situation which never improved. The ceiling height was a maximum 16 feet which precluded the passage of oversized cars. Tunnel watchmen and block operators were used for many years at both ends of the tunnel, but had been removed during the Henry Ford years of ownership. North of Royersville Tunnel were such colorful station names as Pedro, 
Lisman, Goldcamp, Superior, Crawford, Andre, and Hayward arriving at Bloom Junction for the run over the B&O to Jackson. This was a 23-mile stretch of trackage rights over the B&O. DTNI passenger trains did have the privilege to stop at Oak Hill about halfway between Jackson and Bloom Junction. The whole south end of the DTNI frustrated Henry Ford. He wanted to build an entirely new route. Out in the yard, we find a carman applying a stencil to a newly painted boxcar and applying a coat of paint to reveal the DTNI logo. As the camera pans the shop facilities, note the logos on many of the buildings. Panning the complex from left to right, the rip tracks with all of the freight cars undergoing repair are in the foreground left. The shop buildings for all heavy and program repairs sits behind the rip tracks. And as we move to the right, we can see the roundhouse and the water tank. The story is told of the railroad hiring a new machinist just after Henry Ford took over. At his first day on the job, he walked down the tracks and thought he'd pull his pipe out for a smoke. No more had he lighted his pipe and he was tapped on the shoulder by one of the watchmen, advising him that smoking was not permitted on the property. He put his pipe away, went in and did his task at the machine shop, then went into the cab of the locomotive to apply the part that had been in question. He was standing on the engineer's seat when suddenly there's a tug at his pant leg and he's politely told that there are step ladders to be used when happening to reach high places in the locomotive cab. Having gotten the step ladder and finished the work in the locomotive cab, he didn't see any more machine work to do, so he went over and sat down. To which the foreman came out and advised him that he was to get a can of whitewash and a paintbrush and proceed to start whitewashing the walls of the roundhouse. At the end of the week, he gave up in frustration, quit the railroad, and went back to the big four shops at Bell Fountain, Ohio. The shop complex did include a transfer table. In this scene, we can see the offices and the stores department. And in the closing scene of the shops, we can see the buildings from the Athens Street side. Note the pit track is covered with water and ice, a real problem if they wanted to unload a car at ground level. Locomotive servicing at Jackson included filling the tender or tank with water. Here we either see one of the engine hostlers from the roundhouse or the fireman of the locomotive as he stands atop the tender tank and pulls down the water spout to begin filling the tank. This particular water tank held 47,000 gallons of water. While it was a wooden tank, Ford had many of the tanks along the railroad rebuilt as all steel tanks. With water complete, the locomotive moves on over to the coal dock for a shot of black diamonds. This wooden building held several hundred tons of coal up in the air that would be gravity fed into the coal bunker of the locomotive tender. With the tender filled, the chute would be raised and the fireman would climb down into the locomotive cab to attend the boiler. Number 5, the northbound passenger train, arrives at Jackson from Ironton. Under Ford, the train crew was expected to not only handle the care and needs of the passengers, but as they made each station stop, the crew was expected to do general housekeeping to not only the train, but the station grounds. This included washing the coach windows, as well as weeding the flower beds around the station. They were also known to maintain tracks, that is to drive spikes, pull weed, and tighten joint bar bolts. Just another day on Henry Ford's DTNI. One of the DTNI's largest customers on the south end were the Silvery Pig Iron producers. At Jackson, there were two, Globe Iron Works and the Jackson Iron and Steel Company, also known as JISCO. Between the two plants, they jointly produced several hundred thousand tons of pig iron every year. Almost all of the resources necessary to produce the pig iron was literally at their doorstep, including iron ore, coal, limestone, and sand. By the time JISCO started in 1906, the iron fields were starting to play out. Thus, they went up to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and northeastern Wisconsin to obtain iron ore. This resulted in much traffic for the DTNI. 
inbound iron ore and outbound pig iron, not to mention inbound coal, sand, and limestone. Main Bridge was 99 miles north of Ironton and at one point had been a terminal between Springfield and Jackson on the former Ohio Southern Railroad. Main line speed limits were 40 miles an hour for passenger trains and 25 miles an hour for freight trains on tangent track and 25 miles an hour for passenger trains. The station and grounds were well kept. This was a requirement under Henry Ford's ownership. At the Bainbridge Coal Dock, a passenger train stops for a mid-division refueling. In addition to the station grounds, the site also included a coal tipple, sand house, turntable, and water tank for all locomotives. Helper engines were routinely turned here after they had come down from the north side of Summit Hill. Henry Ford had originally planned to build an entirely new route of railroad around Summit Hill down to Portsmouth, Ohio and the Norfolk and Western Railway. But the Interstate Commerce Commission blocked his plans in 1924. Henry Ford's executive train, pulled by DTNI 460 number 80, a Wabash combination baggage and coach, and the private car Fairlane. The Fairlane belonged to Henry and Clara Ford. It was built by Pullman Standard in 1920. At the Rouge work, several men are boarding number 80 for a journey down the track pulling the Fairlane. Number 80 and the Fairlane prepared to depart from the Rouge. When Ford was testing a new automobile, the Fairlane often went along on the railroad carrying Henry Ford Automotive Engineering Group. The train stopped to get automotive reports at various stations. As the number 80 and the Fairlane depart the Rouge, we find none other than Henry Ford himself at the throttle. He was a throttle artist and oftentimes ran the trains when he was making inspection trips on the DTNI. He was years ahead of his time in the implementation of the railroad as part of the automotive manufacturing assembly line. Former employees also report having seen Henry Ford pumping a hand car periodically, especially in the Jeffersonville and Kingman branch.